Hello, my name is Roman Herkovsky. I work for IBM as an executive IT specialist for the worldwide WebSphere technical sales team. In this session, we'll cover WebSphere application server comparison to Tomcat, JBoss, and WebLogic server. This is the same session that I've done at the IBM Interconnect conference back in February in Las Vegas. So let's get started. First thing that I wanted to discuss is the IBM Open Source Plus strategy. As you probably know, it's impossible these days to build products completely from scratch. Whether you are a software maker or a car manufacturer, for instance, General Motors, Toyota, Honda, they cannot possibly make all of their cars from scratch and cover entire process of manufacturing their nuts and bolts, the transmission parts and metal and rubber and all of the other types of things, leather for seats, for wood for some fancy dashboards, those things are provided by other manufacturers. Very similar concept in the software world. The vendors like IBM and to lesser degree Oracle, uh, larger degree Red Hat, use a lot of open source to build products. So for instance, when we build WebSphere application server, uh, we use over 100 packages by building application server. In MQ, we use over 30 packages. Worklight uses over 100 open source packages. IBM Big Insights uses over 40 open source packages. And there are different packages that we use. Uh, we use Apache CXF, OpenJPA, Eclipse Link for JPA, we use Apache Arius and Apache HTTP server which is bundled with every WebSphere package. Um, we created and contributed to Eclipse, uh, use Dojo and many 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 other open source projects, Apache Commons and so forth. So IBM has several thousand developers involved in building different open source projects. We're leading number of those open source projects and we contribute to many many of those open source projects, several hundred different open source projects where IBM is very active participant. So that's how we do develop software these days. In terms of the market share, so let's look at some of the interesting statistics. This is according to Gartner, their report that was published in March 2014. I imagine Gartner will probably publish a new report very shortly, maybe even within a few weeks after I publish this recording. But what you notice here is that the market share numbers are quite interesting. So what what is the one dynamic that you could see here? Well, the first thing that I see here is that the market share for most of the IBM software is number one. So if you look at the business process management, you look at ASB, message-oriented middleware, um, managed file transfer, transaction processing monitors, appliances, B2B software, IBM is ranked as number one. In some cases, we're growing faster than the market. For instance, in ESB space, we're growing faster than the market. Um, in BPM space, we're growing almost as fast as the market, but we're on number one, where Oracle is number four in BPM. They're number four, uh, number two, and very distant with very small growth rate, growing slower than the market in ESB space. Uh, and so forth. Now let's look at application servers which is the subject of this session. So we're mark ranked as number two behind Oracle being number one but you could see that the growth rate for Oracle is way slower than the IBM growth rate and the way that Oracle reports revenue for application servers is different so they have bigger market share and the way that Gartner measures market share is by revenue associated in a given year for license and support. And, and Oracle reports revenue for application server by splitting some of the products. For instance, their BPM and ESB and some other products, even their applications, they come with WebLogic Server or GlassFish or OC4J, one of those three embedded. 
and they're actually split that part of the revenue and report it into their application server revenue. So that gives them a boost in application server where IBM does not split app server when it comes bundled with other IBM products. There are many, many IBM products, not just BPM and ESB, but Tivoli products, Rational, Lotus products, and many other IBM products that come with bundled web server application server. We do not report that revenue as part of our was revenue as far as tomcat you could see uh, i'm sorry jboss they are growing relatively fast but they're growing on a very small base so yes a 15 percent year to year growth on 2.5 percent share that's a very very small share and it's always very easy to grow on a small share so it's gonna if they continue doing that it's gonna take many years for them to catch up anywhere close to IBM or Oracle. So let's move on from market share. Let's have a quick look at the magic quadrant for on-premise application platform. So as you can see, IBM is ranked as the leader. Uh, Oracle is trailing behind and Red Hat is trailing behind in the application server platforms. Now let's talk about the technical capabilities. So I'll spend the next maybe half an hour to 40 minutes on technical discussion and then we'll take a 20 minutes for pricing discussion at the end of this session. First of all, let me cover what's new in Liberty Profile. So you probably heard that IBM shipped Liberty Profile about three years ago, actually three and a half years ago now, and we have updated it aggressively with a lot of new features. So in the second half 2014, in December actually, we added auto scaling capabilities to Liberty Profile. So this is very similar to dynamic clustering in Web Server App Server Network deployment, where depending on the load on the server, we can bring up new instances and JVMs and start them up dynamically so administrator doesn't have to do it by hand. We improved performance and security, as always. We've added partial Java EE7 support. We improved the migration toolkit significantly. I'll cover that later. We have new single sign-on options with OpenID, uh, supported CouchDB, added REST connector for non-Java clients, added JSR 109 support, added a lot of beta features like session initiation protocol, JMS 2.0, JAXA REST 2.0, JDBC, JPA 2.1, and, and on and on and on. In February, we have a new beta. So some of these things are beta, some of them are generally supported. So for instance, now you can run Liberty Profile on Java SE8. So that's not a beta, that's generally supported. And we shipped analytics and log collector for Liberty. We have beta version of Java EE7 support in Liberty Profile. Uh, we have a lot of improvements in the admin center. So this is very significant. So for instance, in the admin center, which looks, by the way, very slick, you can now tag items. For instance, you can add custom tags and say that this JDBC data source is related to whatever application or it has certain tag maybe says staging or Peter or Roman and that tagging can be used for searching there are advanced monitoring capabilities for JVM monitoring and application server and clustering and application monitoring great scalability improvements so you can scale it up to tens of thousands of JVMs including out of scaling in a few minutes, you can actually start several thousand JVMs. It's very, very quick to start. I'll cover that a little bit later. Improvements to configuration, so you can start doing some configuration changes through the admin center, not only at the file level or command line scripting level. We also added remote debugger and repository integration, uh, beta version of the Spinigo, single sign-on for Windows, and we announced no charge Liberty Base for production. So this is actually interesting. Uh, what this is, is that any company or any individual anywhere can download Liberty from IBM website wasdev.net and they can run it in production without paying IBM anything for the license or support. Obviously it's a non-supported environment, but they get two gigabyte total Java heap. So for instance, if you have 
several JVMs. So let's say you have 512 megabyte JVM, that means you can run four of those in production on different servers, on the same server, it was in the same OS or different OS, it doesn't really matter. As long as the total number of JVMs multiplied by the memory usage for each JVM does not exceed 2 gigabyte. So that's quite interesting and obviously it addresses some of the requirements of consultants or private projects or small deployments where you don't need production support from IBM. And this is in addition to the IBM Liberty Core pricing. By the way, this is Liberty Base. We also have Liberty Core pricing, which is says Liberty Core, Liberty Core for ISVs. So Liberty Core for ISVs, that means is that any ISV can ship their application and run it, their customers can run it on Liberty and they don't have to purchase licenses or support for Liberty Core runtime if they don't want to. Optionally they can purchase license and support but they don't have to. And we also improved support for Bluemix. There are a number of things that we shipped in February and now in March because I'm recording this at the end of March there's actually new March beta and we have included Liberty March beta on Bluemix which is IBM platform as a service environment. Now let's see how we position different flavors of WebSphere relative to each other. On a horizontal scale, I have the size of the environment. So from a small environment, one or two servers, to hundreds or even thousands of servers and quality of services. On the vertical scale, I have the programming model. Just basic Java servlet JSP programming model, full Java EE programming model, and extensions to Java EE. So you could see that we have Liberty Core, which we sell as independent product. So that's number one. Number two, we have Was Express as a product, and Was Express bundles WebSphere Liberty Profile. Number three, we have WebSphere Application Server, or sometimes we call it Was Base. It also bundles Liberty Profile, so you could uh, roughly map it something perhaps like this and number four we have WASND which also comes with Liberty Profile inside of WASND uh, so there are four flavors of WebSphere that we sell and the scalability improves as you go up the stack and also the programming model is very consistent in WAS Express and WAS and WASND so we support exactly the same programming model Liberty Core programming model is just a little bit more limited compared to Liberty Profile. Um, so I, I would say Liberty Core um, is a little below the basic Liberty. Now how does it map to Tomcat? Tomcat only gives you Java and JSP servlet programming model. If you need JPA or web services or anything else, in other words, if you need to bring up the programming model in Tomcat, you start adding third-party packages, for instance, Hibernate or Apache CXF or other things. So that's the programming. From a scalability perspective, you could run Tomcat on a handful of servers, but it doesn't come with administration tools, so you have to manage it yourself manually. Now, how do we compare it to JBoss? JBoss does provide full Java EE programming model, so it does cover all the JTA, EJB, JMS, and those APIs, but it doesn't scale quite as well as WASND or even Liberty that's included in WASND because it does have a number of extensions which I'll cover later. Uh, so roughly JBoss, which I have listed right here, so this yellow uh, rectangle or semi-oval or whatever that is, rectangle with rounded corners, compares best either to Liberty or WebSphere Base. In terms of WebLogic, WebLogic compares mostly to WAS and WAS and D to some extent, but it doesn't usually run well in the very small environments for cost reasons and the footprint reasons. So that's why you see this gap for smaller environments 
web logic is typically not used. So it's medium to larger environments. And there is still this gap with web logic because it lacks the features that we provide in even in Liberty, dynamic clustering and in was in D intelligent management, we call them IM intelligent management features, which I'll cover later. Uh, so that's why web logic doesn't map exactly to was in D. From a developer perspective, I've done extensive testing of Liberty, Full Web Server Profile, Tomcat, Jetty, Glassfish, WebLogic, Wildfly, and JBoss EAP. This was about a year and a half ago. At that time, I used all the latest versions. You can read complete report on my blog, ywebserver.com, or you can click here. You can also get this presentation on SlideShare, and when you get that on SlideShare, you can get PowerPoint version as well. On the blog, you can read all the methodology, you can download my scripts, I scripted everything. So all of these times were measured through the bash script, automated provisioning you know, of the server, installation, deployment, and I measured how long it takes to deploy an application, to start and stop application. And I also looked at the memory usage. So from a server startup time perspective, and again, this was done a year and a half ago. Liberty had a very fast startup time. This was all done on ThinkPad laptop, very small laptop in a virtual machine environment on VMware ESX. Um, the VMware ran on Windows and the virtual images were Linux based. You could see that server startup time for Liberty was very fast pretty much the same as Tomcat and this was a hello world application very basic application Liberty started way faster than Glassfish way faster than WebLogic way faster than WebSeer full profile a little bit faster than JBoss that's a startup time the server restart time for Liberty was actually the fastest so that means when you have the running server and you need to recycle it Liberty re restarted faster than anybody else, except for the Jetty runtime, way faster than WebLogic or full WebSphere profile. The dynamic configuration in WebSphere Liberty is very, very good. For instance, you can change a lot of things in Liberty server.xml file, and those things are all picked up dynamically without you having to restart JVM. It's useful in development, and it's useful in production as well. So just to give you an example, if you go to server.xml and you change the, for instance, port number, the port number is picked up automatically. You don't have to bounce the JVM for that to be effective. Every other server requires JVM restart for port number changes. Or if you need to add something else, like maybe changing JDBC data sources or adding them, restarting, changing their properties or JMS connection factories or changing the uh, options of the server itself, the logging levels or many other changes, you will find yourself bouncing JVM with many of the servers, not with Liberty Profile. Application deployment is another thing where Liberty is very, very uh, robust. You could see the deployment of the application took 1.7 seconds and this is actually measuring up to the time when you can get the application response through the browser window. It's not just when you deploy and the log message shows up. If you measure by the log message, Liberty is fastest. If you measure by the application web page available, it trails just a little bit behind Wildfly and JBoss uh, by a fraction of a second, 0 0.7 of a second. So that's not really noticeable for small application. For larger applications, it will be very similar to others and it's actually faster than Tomcat, especially for large applications. I'll explain why. The memory usage on Liberty is smaller than JBoss, it's smaller than WebLogic, than Glassfish, and it's only a little bit, tiny bit bigger than Tomcat or Jetty. Disk footprint is only 65 megabyte, which is very small. And actually, if you trim it down, there is a Minify version for Liberty. So if you have JSP servlet application and you run, you run server-minify command for that application, it will take it down to 20 megabyte, which happens to be the same size as Tomcat. Jetty is a little bit smaller, 
Glassfish and WebLogic and JBoss are way bigger than Liberty in terms of the disk footprint. Now you can also create additional instances of Liberty, the same binary but multiple profiles. So usually with Tomcat you would run, most cases you would run additional binaries but you can create profiles for extra Tomcat instances which would be same in size as Liberty but for WebLogic or JBoss the extra profiles are bigger than Liberty so if you have a JVM density that's maybe in the order of hundreds or even thousands per VM that would start to be noticeable installation time for Liberty is very quick you just unzip so that's very very quick 15 seconds for Tomcat it's about 8 seconds JD about 5 seconds Glassfish 25 seconds JBoss about 20 seconds with WebLogic and full WebSeer profile about 20 minutes number of configuration files in Liberty is just one in full WebSeer profile there are over 100 unfortunately Tomcat is roughly seven different configuration files JD about 32 Glassfish about 9, WebLogic about 20, Wildfly and JBoss more than 20 configuration files. One main configuration file but many smaller ones that are complementary. Development tool support in Liberty is very good and with beta version again I measured and ranked this a year and a half ago with latest beta versions I would say we're getting very close to advanced Eclipse support and there's a free Eclipse plugin. Um, the best development support is in full WebSeer profile and WebLogic where JBoss and Tomcat Tomcat is basic IDE support by Tom, JBoss is very good uh, IDE support configuration editor in Eclipse we provide a very good Eclipse editor for Liberty profile where all of the other servers don't have anything like that so you could use XSSD driven configuration but it's nowhere as powerful as Eclipse based configuration server.xml editor in Liberty administration GUI again back year and a half ago it was very basic now I would say the administration GUI is good and we're trying very hard to make it advanced. Uh, hopefully later this year when we add extra features to administrative GUI it will become a very advanced administration GUI. For now the best GUI belongs to the WebSeer app server and WebLogic application server. JBoss admin GUI is very basic. JBoss operations network is also very basic and it's actually not working very well it's quite complicated and most customers choose not to use it for real deployments Liberty just like all of the other servers has very good support for Ant, Maven, Jenkins and you can use it for other build servers and Bamboo and those kinds of things in terms of APIs provided I'll cover that later the development license for Liberty is free you don't have to pay anything just like for full WebSeer profile or any other server for that matter so Wildfly, JBoss EAP, WebLogic, Glassfish, JD, Liberty and WebSphere you can use for free in development no charge at all in fact if you have production licenses of Liberty or WebSeer profile you also get free support for your development environment this is something you don't get with other servers except for JBoss they will support your developers if you have production subscription for JBoss but for WebLogic and others there is no free support for development environment now let's keep talking about development so here's another research that I've done comparing the API provided in Liberty, WebSphere, Full Profile, Tomcat, and JBoss. Again, you can read more details in the blog article on whywebsphere.com. And I mapped API support between all of these different servers. So there is Liberty Core, and there is Liberty that ships with WAS, Base, and WAS ND. So there's a bit of a difference between Core and Liberty that's part of Base namely the JMS provider is not bundled with Liberty Core and JAX WS is not bundled with Liberty Core as far as everything else you could see the programming model is 
the same between Liberty Core and Liberty Base, except for these two APIs. Now we have beta version of Web uh, Profile 7 and full EE Profile 7. For WAS ND, for WebSeer full profile, we have a statement of direction. Uh, and actually, these these are incorrect. So now, JVM JDK 7 is fully supported. It's not beta. It's fully supported in WebSphere Liberty Profile. And you could see that we have pretty much all of the Java E specs covered in Liberty. We have all of them covered, all of the JE6 in WebSphere Profile and Statement of Direction says that Java E7 will be available on full WebSphere Profile very soon and like I said again JE7 is already in beta on Liberty. When you're using Tomcat you only get JSP servlet support and JDBC support through the JDBC drivers with data sources. That's it. If you need JPA or you need JAXWS or you need REST or you need Jersey or OS authentication or other things, with Tomcat what you end up doing, you end up downloading the Spring, Hibernate, CXF, Jersey or other Apache or other libraries from elsewhere and adding them and integrating them into your Tomcat environment. At first it may seem to be easy and there is nothing wrong with using open source frameworks because guess what a lot of these things are bundled in JBoss EAP for instance and some of them are bundled in Liberty. Remember I mentioned that we are using over 100 open source projects in Liberty. The difference is when you use it in JBoss or if you use it in Liberty, those are fully integrated. So for instance in WebSphere Full Profile or Liberty, your GPA provider, your JAXWS, your REST provider, your um, other providers, they're fully integrated. So for instance, when you have an application that uses all of those and you probably use Java annotations, when we start your application, we don't have to have multiple annotation scanning by Hibernate, by Spring, by JAXWS, like CXF or Jersey. The startup time for that kind of complex application for Tomcat starts growing very quickly because you have all of those independent frameworks loaded. They don't know anything about each other. They do annotation scanning repeatedly and for large applications your Tomcat startup times will be in the minutes. For Liberty and full web server profile the startup time for those applications will still be seconds very very fast because we're not doing it repeatedly we integrated it. That's one thing. Another thing security, management, logging, configuration, administration, monitoring all of those things are integrated by the vendor like JBoss for instance or IBM in full web server profile or Liberty profile. We don't have to force our users to use different logging, different monitoring, different configuration for all of the different frameworks because we integrated it through a single console, same administration server.xml file so you don't have to go mess with many dozens of configuration files. So when I showed you the previous screen of the startup time, this was for Hello World application. It was not for a complex application. Um, not to mention vendor support. If you have an issue with any of the components, you call IBM or in case of Red Hat, you call them for JBoss and they provide support for those components. In case of Tomcat, you're on your own. You could be using web forums or figuring it out based on the source code. Those are significant differences how you integrate it. Security patching is another thing. How do you know what version of CXF works with ver what version of Spring and so forth? So some of that information is available on forums but you become more or less your own systems integrator. Uh, and that's part of the reason that the Apache Tommy Enterprise Edition of Tomcat is trying to achieve the same integration benefits but it's not really getting much traction. There is 
um, not a significant adoption and still you have an issue of support and all of the other permutations of different packages working or maybe not working together very well. To help you decide which is the right target environment for your application, we have the Technology Evaluation Report. It's a free Eclipse plugin that you can get for any Eclipse version from Eclipse Marketplace. You just search, you download and you install that plugin for free. And that plugin is called IBM Migration Toolkit, Web Serial App Server Migration Toolkit. So you go ahead and install Vanilla Eclipse, go to Help Marketplace, download IBM Migration Toolkit, and it will analyze your application, it will tell you what are the APIs used in your application and it will tell you where can you deploy that application. Can you run it in Liberty Core or WAS Base or WAS ND? It's very helpful and it's free of charge, very easy to use. So now we're getting into some more advanced topics. So one of the popular items is performance. We always get to talk about performance when we talk about production deployments of applications and we have a very strong history of performance with Web Serial Application Server. So these numbers are full Web Serial profile, not Liberty. We have similar performance benchmarks for Liberty but not using the SpecJ Enterprise 2010. We're using DayTrader for Liberty. Now in the SpecJ Enterprise 2010, from 2010 up until now, five years, we have improved performance of WebSphere per core by the factor of 7.4. So these numbers that you see on the chart, they're normalized by core. You could see the hardware used, in some cases it was 8 core hardware, 12 cores, 16 cores, 24 cores. Don't worry about the number of cores because we divided the total number of transactions by the number of cores. So all of these are normalized by a 1 core performance. And what you can see is that one core back in 2010 could run 7.4 times less transactions than one core in 2014 on the power server. And by the way there is a new benchmark that we ran in February 2015 on Intel platform where we ran 688 transactions per core faster than WebLogic by 31 percent by the way. Now what is the lesson here? One lesson is if you have an application that runs on WebSphere 7 on old hardware and you need to run more transactions because you were having more customers, you were having success, your business is growing, one way you can deal with that is buy new more hardware of the same kind for that new hardware you'll buy more WebSphere licenses of version 7 and that means you will pay extra for hardware and extra for licenses and get more transactions because you scaled horizontally for instance. That's one way. The other way to do it is move up to the latest Intel or maybe Power hardware upgrade the version of WebSphere so yes you will pay for the hardware but because the hardware is faster, you will need 7.4, I'm sorry, 7.4 times less licenses and hardware to run the same workload. So maybe because you have to have so much less hardware, you can pay back just in power and cooling. Think about it. Power and cooling is quite expensive. In one year, you're going to pay probably pay back for the power server just because you're saving so much on the power and cooling even though you bought new hardware. Not to mention you don't need quite as many licenses. You will need 7.4 times fewer licenses to, to handle the same workload. So where are all of these improvements in performance coming from? So they come from three places. One is the hardware itself. It gets faster over time. That's number one. Number two, you get newer version of JDK. So from JDK 1.4 to 5 to 6 to 1.7 and now Liberty can run on 1.8, you can run faster. And number three is the WebSphere itself. WebSphere has significant performance improvements version to version 
and by upgrading to the latest version of WebSphere you can run faster. So these three factors contribute together. Obviously you can get better performance by just upgrading the hardware but you'll get even better performance if you upgrade your JDK and WebSphere as well. Comparing Oracle and IBM performance, these were done in February, just one month ago, and they were published one day apart. And these are enterprise Java operations per second per core processor core on identical hardware. Oracle had 522 transactions per core, we ran 688, 31% faster, same application, same year file, no difference at all, same hardware, WebSphere being faster than WebLogic. If you look at the, so this is again the same benchmark on Intel Haswell processors, and if you look at total number of transactions per second, WebSphere was faster in terms of total of transactions. So these numbers on the right on top right transactions per core numbers on the bottom are total number of transactions overall so WebSphere was faster there as well if you look at other platforms not just Intel but Power and Spark you could see that comparing Spark and IBM Power we ran almost twice as many transactions per core as Oracle ran on their Spark servers, so that is a very powerful message. And more historical performance numbers comparing Spark, Intel uh, with WebLogic and comparing Intel and Power with WebSphere. In every case, WebSphere ran more transactions per core and in many cases more total transactions. And you could see here comparing the total number of transactions between WebSphere and WebLogic. One thing to mention, Red Hat never published a single benchmark for SpecJ Enterprise 2007. Every year I hear them saying at their conferences that they're just about to publish the result and it's imminent and it will be there in a few days or weeks. Never published. Not once. So that's why we run JBoss Wildfly and JBoss EAP transactions ourselves. Now a little more statistics on comparing WebSphere and WebLogic performance. So the chart on the top half shows number of transactions per core. And you can see older results on the bottom, newer results on the top. And you could see that WebSphere ran more transactions per core for all of the new benchmarks. And you could see Oracle older results on the right, newer results on the left. So you could see we dominate in terms of number of transactions per core unless, unless you're comparing latest Oracle benchmark to very old IBM benchmarks, which is not an apples to apples comparison anyway. So we have more transactions per core. Now that's really not very interesting. Number of transactions per core is nice but what I really care about as a customer, I care about the dollars per transactions. I want to know how much am I going to pay for my transactions. That's where the table at the bottom comes in. I calculated the total cost per transaction by summarizing the cost of hardware, database, application server, networking, and storage. Everything that you need to run the environment. Again, it's a complete price of database with hardware, networking, storage, and application server with software and hardware. So it's all Oracle and all IBM software combined. And there, per transaction, we have a great advantage against Oracle. Once again, it's cheaper. Not only you get more transactions per core, but it's cheaper to run it on WebSphere than it is to run it on Oracle. On Spark, on power, on Intel, across the board we have better transaction throughput and we have cheaper cost per transaction. And you could see more details on my blog widewebser.com, uh, more detailed description of the data that I'm presenting here. So for a second let's talk about platform as a service. I'm not gonna 
cover general why you need platform as a service and what it is. I assume that you already know that. Last year in 2014, IBM made Bluemix available for general consumption and you can use it for development, you can use it for production and you can use it for testing or any other purpose that you'd like. There are great free tiers for every service. I think at this moment IBM has roughly somewhere about 80 if not 100 different services available on Bluemix. And the services, you could see the runtimes like the Java runtime, the Node.js runtime, PHP, Ruby on Rails runtime. You can bring your own runtime that we do not provide. Uh, there are services available. For instance, there is Liberty service, there is MQ Lite service, RabbitMQ service, analytic services, Big Data, Watson, mobile notification, MySQL services, Postgres, MongoDB, Redis, I already mentioned RabbitMQ, Maximo services, monitoring analytics, log analytics, lots and lots of very cool services, geolocation services, like I said, between 80 to 100 different services, all running on IBM Cloud, on SoftLayer, available as a platform, as a service, very, very powerful. By the way, I recently migrated my application that I ran, wrote for my Pittsburgh Triathlon Club members just running some training statistics and stuff. I, I built it originally on Google um, App Engine because there was no Bluemix available and last year I migrated that from Google to the Bluemix and I posted the des description and steps for migration and overall experience on the whywebster.com blog which I found Bluemix to be very very useful and because of the free tier available for pretty much all of these services I run that application free of charge for my club there is no cost because it's not a millions of messages per day uh, our club only has like 500 members uh, so the free tier is more than enough for the purpose of my application the interesting part is that you can build your environment, build your application and decide to deploy it either in your personal data center or in the appliance or on the public cloud. When you use IBM Pure Application System and you create your patterns for your applications, those patterns are highly portable it's very easy to run those patterns on your own hardware so let's imagine that you have a pool of VMware ESX servers you have vBlock or other Intel hardware with VMware ESX servers you can deploy those patterns on your Intel ESX servers or you can deploy those patterns on IBM Cloud or if you have appliance from IBM, which is a pure app appliance, you can de deploy those patterns on the appliance. So it's very flexible, very powerful notion. And now you can do that with Docker, Chef, and the deployment of those patterns is very, very fast. Uh, so these patterns are specifically for WebSphere full profile and they're for WebSphere Liberty profile, they're for IBM integration bus, for MQ, WebSphere Commerce and many other IBM products. So they're not limited to only application server. Those patterns can include DB2, caching, LDAP, HTTP servers, all kinds of IBM products. And you can create your own patterns for non-IBM products as well. And again, those patterns are deployable as a single click into your private platform as a service in case of the appliances or bring your own hardware or in the public IBM software software cloud so that's a very powerful notion and the reason you want to deploy it as a pattern because it's way cheaper than doing it yourself when you do it yourself you could see there are a lot of different cost items associated with doing it yourself the pattern engine and platform as a service reduces your cost significantly so a lot of these things will be eliminated and a lot of the labor and in some cases even the hardware cost will be eliminated now when you compare it to some of the vblock or oracle Exalogic, 
they are not as efficient as the pure application system. You can see more in the white paper that IBM published. There's a powerful pattern editor, so you have all kinds of widgets on the left. You can drag and drop these widgets on the right. When you click on the widget, you can go into properties, you can configure different properties for those components. For instance, if it's a JVM policy, what is a scaling policy, what's SLA, how, how many times and under what conditions does it need to automatically create new instances. What are the JDBC connections to the database, which by the way, database, you drag and drop it from the left into right. You can add caching to the pattern. You can add HTTP servers to your patterns. So it's very powerful how you can design those patterns. And the nice thing, you can define license tracking. You can define CPU, memory, disk tracking, operating system usage, all kinds of reporting and all kinds of charge back and very quick deployment with access controllers who can deploy what pattern and those patterns again they can include database HTTP server app server messaging ESB and you can deploy these patterns again like I showed you before two pages ago on private hardware on appliance or in the cloud it's very powerful notion very productive so again, to summarize, now let's just look at WebSphere App Server. So if you want to do it yourself, you can do it on-premise, number one. You can run it in the public infrastructure as a service cloud, or you can run it in the public platform as a service cloud. So first, you can do it yourself. So option A, do it yourself on-premise. You can write chef scripts, puppet scripts, you can do urban deploy, or just deploy as usual what WS admin scripts. That's on premise. In the public infrastructure as a service, you can still do it yourself. You just create the Azure VMs or Amazon EC2 VMs, and you could automate it by hand, or you can use urban code or chef scripts and so forth. Deploying it into the public as a service uh, platform as a service cloud, you can do it on Cloud Foundry or you can even have Liberty build packs that we provide for OpenShift. So you can download them from Docker and deploy Liberty on OpenShift if you want. Now with the pure application system, option B, on premise makes it a lot easier than do it yourself because we give you the appliance or you can bring your own hardware but with a pure app system from the appliance you can bring it into your own hardware or into that same appliance that makes it way more productive than building your own scripts now with a pure application system you cannot really deploy it into the infrastructure as a service cloud but you can deploy it into the pure app on software that's a very easy option and option C is using Bluemix. So we announced Bluemix Local as a beta. Obviously, Bluemix as IIS is not available, but if you want to deploy it on the cloud, then you can use two things. One, Bluemix shared or Bluemix dedicated, which means it will run on a dedicated hardware, but that hardware will be on IBM software cloud. So these are your options for deploying web server application server applications. In terms of administration, you can always edit configuration files for application server. You could use administrative GUI or you can write command line scripting. So obviously in development, editing files using administrative GUI is preferred, but in production, you're better off automating your scripting either with pure application system or Bluemix or chef scripts or WS admin scripts and make it very very repeatable with problem determination tools we provide a lot of those very useful tools with web server application server with other IBM products in a way of IBM support assistant so we give that to IBM customers for free you download IBM support assistant and you get performance analyzer you get memory management tooling 
dump analyzer, garbage collection visualizer, memory analyzer, health center for performance tuning, thread and memory, uh, monitor dump analyzer for Java, uh, and trace analyzer, the web server plugin analyzer. So all of these tools are available from one user interface. You can run them against your Java heap dumps, against your log files that you download from WebSphere. That really helps you to fine-tune WebSphere, to troubleshoot it, uh, resolve issues. And in some cases, some of the subset of capabilities are provided with Oracle JDK, for instance. Although if you want to have support for Oracle JDK, you have to pay for it. But other things are not available for JBoss and Tomcat environments. You could purchase third-party tools for some of these, but some of them are not even available from a third party. So that makes your troubleshooting more difficult. Now, the other things that we make available with WebSphere App Server is Automated Performance Tuning Advisor, which can look at your runtime performance and generate recommendations for thread pools, for JDBC, uh, configuration tuning and other things. This is something that you don't get with Tomcat or JBoss. You would have to manually do analysis of your performance and manually make adjustments where in case of WebSphere the performance advice is generated in the console. Very easy to use, very powerful. I already mentioned that administration in production really needs to be scripted because it needs to be repeatable and it needs to be tested. You could script administration with Tomcat and JBoss, but that scripting is manual. The way that you can script administration in WebSphere, and same thing with WebLogic as well, you can use the admin console first. In the admin console, you can enable command assistant, and that command assistant will generate WS admin script for WebSphere. So you can later copy paste and customize your scripts that you've done through the wizard in the GUI and then you just substitute those for environment variables or other command line properties and you can run that script in production. It makes it very easy to create very sophisticated scripts. Plus we provide a large library of scripts of reusable scripts to manage WebSphere clustering on a large scale. Again, makes it very easy, very productive to do the administration of WebSphere. In case of JBoss and Tomcat, those capabilities are not available. First of all, most JBoss and Tomcat customers are not using clustering because there is not really a benefit of using clustering in JBoss, except maybe for HTTP session failover, but the main reason for clustering is reliable failover and administration as one unit. You don't really get that and John being the JBoss operations network is not very robust. So what happens is most of the customers, in my experience 90% or more of the JBoss customers, they're really using standalone JBoss instances even when they use either Wildfly or JBoss EAP. They're not using it in a cluster configuration. Um, they are manually doing all of the management or scripting that themselves or purchasing third-party management tools for JBoss because John is not enough. It doesn't work well enough. Or creating homegrown scripts to generate XML files, configuration files for John, generate SSL, SSH scripts, bash scripts to do JBoss configuration management, deployment, undeployment. A lot of these things are automated with WebSphere App Server Network Deployment, like I mentioned, Command Assist, Administrative GUI, Command Line Management, Scripting, Automated Management of Clustered, very powerful single pane console for many instances, something that you don't get with JBoss. I won't spend much time on some of the tools that I mentioned a couple of charts ago. For instance, the IBM Garbage Collection and Memory Visualizer, which can help you with memory leak detection. It can help you run multiple different garbage policies side by side and compare them to each other. Uh, I have some screenshots and I actually have a video, YouTube videos that I posted on my blog. You can see how to use the 
for instance, in this case, using the generational concurrent or optimized throughput garbage policies on the same application and getting advice on which garbage collection policy is better. So all of these are part of the IBM Support Assistant tool, which we provide for free for WebSeer customers. So these are very powerful tools, uh, give you tuning recommendations. Uh, for instance, it tells you that your application seems to be leaking memory. You may want to fix it and it shows you exactly what's going on at what point it is leaking memory. Similar, another toolkit that is shipped with the IBM Support Assistant is PTT, Performance Tuning Toolkit. It does a health check. It runs the reports on your application, finds potential performance problems, gives you uh, statistics, visual analysis of your performance EJB connection pools JCA and so forth it shows you the statistics pool size you can attach to remote servers you could see the runtime where the time is con consumed the thread pools and all kinds of other things the diagnostic tools for Java like health center it can do uh, dumps of system dumps, heap dumps, Java dumps, and it shows you da data um, in a graphical way or tabular way. For instance, you can run an analysis on what is consuming memory, The, for instance, the locks on your server, and you could see uh, thread statistics and all kinds of really interesting data, uh, and analyze it and drill down uh, and use it in a production environment or development environment if you want okay documentation that's a big thing if you need to run production application you probably need to know what's the best way to configure and how do you fix problems when they arrive IBM has a long history of very mature very detailed documentation for WebSphere application server and other IBM products. With JBoss, the documentation is quite spotty. For some of the capabilities that are very popular, documentation is decent, but for new capabilities, for new releases, or for less frequently used features, it is very hard to find documentation, and many times you are forced to look into the source code. So I think that's a very significant weakness of JBoss, the lack of proper detailed documentation. Now let's talk about messaging. So JMS provider is bundled with the application server. In WebSphere we bundle pure Java JMS provider and app server in full profile and Liberty profile. In JBoss back in 2002 they had JBoss MQ bundled with the app server then they switched it to a new implementation in 2006 JBoss messaging there was no migration pass then they switched it again to Hornet Q which they ship with JBoss app server again with no migration pass now it seems like JBoss is recommend Red Hat is recommending ActiveMQ instead of Hornet Q because of the various issues with Hornet Q and again there is no migration pass and now the ActiveMQ itself, which is Apache project which Red Hat acquired through Fuse acquisition, is being rewritten. So the Hornet Q is being one of the inputs into new messaging, ActiveMQ another input into the new messaging, and the Apache Cupid, which is also sold as Red Hat MRG, is the third input into this new messaging. So sometime in 2015, or maybe 2016 there will be a new messaging I think they call it Apache Apollo the roadmap was published on one of the forums so there is a new migration that is upcoming for those users of ActiveMQ, Hornet Q or Cupid or old JBoss messaging products and it remains to be seen how well it works and how reliable it is and how it compares to, for instance, IBM MQ. Now, I did mention when we talked about the different flavors of WebSphere that we had, Liberty Profile, all the way up to network deployment. So, key characteristic of the WASND network deployment, one of the key items is intelligent management. So, intelligent management has four 
key items. Application edition management, server health management, dynamic clustering, that's based on SLA, and intelligent routing and SLA enforcement. There are significant savings by using these features because you can consolidate a lot of workloads into a much smaller hardware and software footprint. Because of that, you can save on hardware, you can save on licenses, take fewer outages, which means less business cost, and save on labor for administration because a lot of these things are automatic in nature. They don't require administrator activity other than setting them up in advance and then just sitting and watching them run. So let me explain a couple of these things in a little more detail. So for instance, dynamic clustering. In WAS D, and now some of these are also available in Liberty because we provide Liberty dynamic clustering. If you add a new node to WAS D cluster, in WAS D it automatically picks it up. In JBoss EAP or web logic you have to manually add that to a cluster because the cluster is static in web server app server you can do vertical stacking very easily what that means is you can run multiple jvms on the same os and in web sphere you just define one property do you allow vertical stacking and how many maximum number of jvms within the same os and automatically instances will be created if needed. In WebLogic and JBoss and Tomcat, that will be all manual with all the port resolution completely up to you. Cluster isolation. In WebSphere, you can define that different dynamic clusters can run in different isolation groups based on whatever properties you need them to have. The properties could be operating system name or properties, maybe version number or JDBC sources or whatever other custom properties, maybe host name or DNS name or whatever. In JBoss, WebLogic, Tomcat, this all is done manually, very time consuming. What if you increase the workload? In WebSphere, when you increase the workload in Liberty Profile or Full WebSphere Profile in Network Deployment, will automatically create new instances of servers without any administrator involvement will scale up or scale down shut down applications if they're not taking the load and start new instances Tomcat, WebLogic, JBoss that is all manual you have to watch the workload and manually stop and start members of the cluster what if you drop the workload? In WebSphere, when it drops off, we can automatically stop those JVMs so they don't consume memory. JBoss, Tomcat, WebLogic, that is all done manually. What do you have? The shortage of resources. For instance, you have 20 applications. Some of them are more important than others, but they're all having peak workload. In WebSphere, we'll prioritize and enforce the SLA because we will do smart SLA enforcement through the workload management so we'll actually shut down and deprioritize less important applications and will allow more capacity for more important applications in JBoss Tomcat WebLogic none of that is available it's all manual or you ha you have to do it through the load balancer where you customize it yourself so there are a few key advantages there and some more details about the CPU overload protection, the HTTP session rebalancing, automatic restarts, and so forth. So you could see there are a lot of advantages that you get out of the box with WAS ND that you don't get with JBoss. And some more of them, for instance, the health policy enforcement, um, automatic recognition of cookie configuration, and node maintenance modes, and custom login options for on-demand router and so forth. Now let's talk a little bit about running the applications at large scale. So you can, just like with Airplane, you can run it by hand or you could have autopilot. So in case of application servers, running by hand means writing all the scripts to handle all of the different scenarios by hand. You write a script to detect increase in the workload 
and then you write a script to start new servers and that is very labor intensive so the analog of autopilot in WebSphere is this intelligent management and what it does for instance it can do application edition management where you can deploy many applications versions side by side some could be run in validation mode some could be production and you don't have to have a completely separate environment like in JBoss or Tomcat. WebLogic does support this similar capability by the way. Tomcat and JBoss do not. Health management. You can define a lot of various health conditions in WebSphere and some of them in WebLogic by the way. In Tomcat and JBoss that is not available. You would have to manually monitor the environment. So here are some of the examples of health conditions and you can define actions taken automatically by the server. Uh, take it into the maintenance mode, take a heap dump, uh, change login levels, restart, rejoin the cluster or do other things to prevent it. You can define different service policies and their relative importance to each other and their goals response times for instance and different response policies SLAs could be assigned to different applications or one URL in the same application could be assigned to different policies. Now dynamic clustering I mentioned this before that depending on the workload you can start new instances of dynamic clusters dynamically. I recorded a video of that on the blog, if you go to ywebster.com, you could see a video on YouTube how this works. Same thing with intelligent routing. WebSphere has dynamic caching in the DynaCache, and you can use that dynamic caching for web services cache, for HTTP session cache, for dynamic page fragment cache, and it really improves your performance. Plus, we bundle WebSphere Extreme Scale with the product. So you can use it as a DynaCache provider and you can use it as a generic POJO cache as well. With WebLogic you'd have to pay for that extra. We support Java Batch in WebSphere. We support OSGI. We can do intelligent app server management from a job manager, meaning that job manager can manage WebSphere cells and standalone servers as well so each server individually including Liberty profile uh, so that allows you to have multiple job managers to manage multiple servers that is very powerful management console and here's an example you can run all kinds of commands so you can use the GUI or you can script it so the job manager can schedule commands that you can run those administrative commands periodically you, you can expire them you can say when this will be run when it expires and then you can monitor the ex execution of those commands how many completed how many successful unsuccessful you can check mark and you say suspend resume delete it's very powerful asynchronous management for large distributed clusters or standalone servers not only clusters Operating system support. WebSphere has the most robust support for operating systems on Intel platforms, RISC platforms, or Z series platforms. You could see WebLogic has some support and JBoss has some support, but not quite as robust as WebSphere. For instance, WebLogic and JBoss do not run on Z series and they do not support uh, WebLogic supports AIX but JBoss does not support AIX and there are some other um, SUSE is not supported on power for instance for WebLogic Red Hat is not supported on power only AIX and there are other restrictions. In terms of database support WebLogic does not support some of the databases that we support in WebSphere App Server. With JBoss, one of the major issues that I got when I talked to their customers is the migration issue. There is a lot of disruption when you move from JBoss 4 to 5, 5 to 6. A lot of administrative scripts are not backwards compatible because the changes in JBoss administration. That makes it very difficult and expensive to migrate from version to version. And that's where IBM Migration Toolkit comes into place. The Migration Toolkit is free plugin 
for Eclipse and you can download it for free. It supports migration from WebLogic into WebSphere App Server, from Tomcat into WebSphere App Server, from OC4J and JBoss, various versions of JBoss into WebSphere App Server and even old applications from old WebSphere app servers migration toolkit can move to the more recent WebSphere versions and this is an example of what the toolkit looks like it runs analysis it has a set of rules recommendations it generates the uh, Java code review XML code review and it generates suggestions on what needs to be done and a lot of these things can be done automatically the report that gets generated, you can also see what versions of what software it covers. So what versions of JBoss, Tomcat, WebLogic, OC4J, and WAS, it can move into Liberty Profile and Full WebSphere Profile. So from a high level technical feature function map, I have on a single page, Liberty Profile, Full WebSphere Profile Base, was in D. Again, you could see the Java E7 is in beta and statement of direction for WebSphere. And the key differences between WebSphere App Server and Tomcat and JBoss are that we have more robust administration monitoring in was in D. So that's why we don't really compare JBoss to was in D. We compare JBoss to Liberty or was base. So those are the products that have similar features and functions. Tomcat really compares is a subset of Liberty Core. So now time to talk about cost. So let's look at the dollars. We've discussed features and functions. Let's look at dollars. So they're obviously for your applications you have decisions where to deploy it. So you would normally want to minimize total cost of acquisition right the license cost you can deploy to was in D was base Liberty or Bluemix and maybe initially you look at the TCA total cost of acquisition but then you start considering management administration performance availability and you quickly realize it's not about TCA it's about TCO meaning total cost of ownership not just the license cost being total cost of acquisition be the reason is the downtime could be very expensive depending on the industry you could pay millions of dollars per hour of downtime and the relationship between total cost of acquisition and total cost of ownership is that TCO includes TCA but TCA is just 10% of the TCO it's just the license cost where TCO includes all of these other things the administration downtime security integration testing so what do we have in terms of total cost of acquisition reduction TCA reduction the tip of the iceberg so one thing is the developer tools for WebSphere App Server and Liberty are free the runtime itself is also free. I already mentioned Liberty Core for ISVs. If you're an ISV and you build an app, your customers can use Liberty Core at no charge. They can buy support if they want, but they don't have to. I already mentioned the 2 gigabyte promotion. Any company, any individual can use Liberty Profile base, not Liberty Core, but base with JMS, with JAXWS for free as long as the total amount of all of the heap sizes is under 2 gigabyte on Bluemix you can run Liberty Profile for free non-stop for many years up to 1 gigabyte total so that would mean perhaps two instances 512 megabyte each you can run that for production apps or personal hobby apps and this is actually exactly what I'm using for my application that I described on my blog whitewebsphere.com if you have WebSphere tool edition you get free rational app developer 
and limited time offer from IBM that we announced just a few weeks ago is two for one offer for the next six months what that means is let's say you have licenses of Liberty or WebSphere that you run on premise let's say you have 10,000 PVUs of web serial licenses that you run on premise. What you can do for these 10,000 PVU licenses, you can keep running them on premise, but now with this two for one offer, you can also get 10,000 PVUs running on soft layer in parallel for the next six months for production, testing, development, or whatever you like. Or if it's 20,000, or if it's 100,000, or if it's 5 million PVUs, or whatever the number is, one PVU or 50, you can get the same number of that you have on premise in production or supported by IBM on IBM software. There are several different licenses that we have for web here. So we discussed four flavors of web here app server. Liberty Core, Express, Base and ND. Now we have two kinds of licenses. One kind of license is perpetual license. This is where you buy the license and you own it. When you stop paying for support, you can still run it in production because you own the license, you're just not getting IBM support. Second kind of license is rental. This is very similar to JBoss subscription, which you pay every year. And the difference is in IBM case, you can pay by the year like support, you can pay by the months for socket, you can pay by the months per PVU. If you own power, you can pay by the day, subscription by the day, like in a year you can have it for three days. Or you can pay by the hour if you're on the cloud, like smart uh, software, AWS or Azure. So these are different rental options which makes it very flexible and powerful. And these are different perpetual licenses based on per core, per socket. By the way, per socket we only have available for WAS base, which means with WAS base you can run full profile or Liberty, either of the one you decide. And for Liberty Core or WAS Express, we have user based licensing. Of course, we also have unlimited license, but that's negotiated every time. So that's a very flexible licensing model. Uh, in case of JBoss, you only get this license, which is per year PVU and on Amazon and Azure you can pay by the hour. So let me look at the peak workloads. So let's say this is your application and your application has a little bit of variety in the workload. In April it peaks and then you are retail vendor and all of a sudden in November you have so many more licenses, so many more transactions that you ha have to handle. With WebSphere, what you can do, you can buy, you can decide, well, I want to buy 72 cores, or you could say I buy 96 cores, or you could say 144 cores, whatever you decide. You pick a baseline. For this baseline, you buy perpetual licenses, in this case will be eight sockets for was base and for your peak months you will buy the difference the delta for November and the delta for December for December you buy few extra cores or sockets and for November you buy for a few extra sockets or cores and what that means in five years for license and support you will pay two hundred eighty three thousand dollars for was base based on sockets for JBoss you have to pay for the peak workload for entire year so for five years in JBoss case you will pay 1.4 million dollars that's a lot of money for JBoss with WebLogic the same thing you have to buy for the peak now with WebSphere if you run on power and if in November there are two days where you have to have even more licenses you can buy them by the day you can buy three or four days and that could be 100x could be way cheaper 
imagine how much more money you're gonna pay with WebLogic or JBoss or if you have supported Tomcat TC server from Pivotal. So the license model for WebSphere is very flexible. Now if you look at the perpetual licenses, forget all the peak workloads, just look at perpetual licenses. On Intel hardware for physical servers having different number of cores, one socket with different number of cores per socket, different IBM PVU rating. Now for servers with two sockets, different number of cores, four sockets with different number of cores, different PVU rating. Pretty much in every single case, WebSphere App Server is less expensive than JBoss. Surprise, surprise. But this is without those extra components. I have with components to run the app server you need JDK, HTTP server, maybe sometimes LDAP, maybe sometimes even a database for John. So what, what you have here is extra cost for JBoss components. For JDK, if you're on Red Hat Linux, you get OpenJDK supported by Red Hat for free. But if you were on non-Red Hat Linux, then you could use free Oracle JDK or you could buy it. With IBM, you get JDK support free of charge on all platforms. With Red Hat, you could buy LDAP. With IBM, you get that out of the box, Tivoli LDAP, for free with WebSphere. For HTTP session persistence, with WebSphere, it is free. With JBoss, you have to buy for the database if you need to keep your HTTP sessions in a database. With WebSphere, Extreme Scale is included free of charge. With JBoss, you'd pay extra. Load balancer, edge components included with WASMD. With JBoss, you buy F5 or something else. JBoss Operations Network requ requires database to run. PostgreSQL, for instance. WebSphere does not use database for configuration. And last, uh, well, I didn't mention HTTP server included for free with WAS. You can run it on separate server. With JBoss Red Hat, you have to buy JBoss EWS it's not included for free. And finally, last not least, difference in performance. WebSphere is anywhere from 10 to 2 times as fast as JBoss, depending on application. So if it's 30% difference, that means you need more hardware and more licenses to run WebLogic, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> JBoss than WebSphere. And by the way, same thing with WebLogic, because like you've seen, we are 32% faster on the identical hardware compared to WebLogic. So you'll need more hardware for WebLogic too. But wait, it gets better. With support policy with IBM, you get unlimited number of support contacts. With Red Hat, you only get two support contacts up to 32 cores, four up to 64 cores, and maximum you get is 12 contacts. With IBM, it's unlimited. Now, so that was all comparing TCA, total cost of acquisition, the license cost, the tip of the iceberg. And that was comparing WASBase and JBoss. What if you wanted to compare WASND and JBoss? A lot of times people make that comparison. I don't think that is a really fair comparison because there are features for management, intelligent management, for troubleshooting, all of that are completely missing in JBoss. But if you were to compare that, then you would find that with JBoss, you would spend more on hardware, means that you're going to have more licenses and more hardware and power. You'd also spend more on administration, because it doesn't have all the administration tools, more on infrastructure administration, installation, and you're taking more risk and downtime because you don't have the troubleshooting tools, you don't have SLA management, so you'll still end up paying more in all of these other costs, even though you pay nothing in the license and you pay less in software support. So JBoss EAP is more expensive than WASMD, precisely because WASMD has those extra features that JBoss does not provide. And they're actually evidence from independent third parties. So if you look at the Forrester report, migration example from an open source application into WebSphere, one very big customer had 44% ROI. 
by moving into WebSphere App Server. Another customer had 42% ROI by moving from JBoss to WebSphere. Now this session is supposed to cover web logic pricing as well. Well, that is another interesting discussion. And this is getting a very long session though. Hopefully you have the nerves to stick around and um, listen for all this time. Or you can split it into multiple recordings sessions. Now, in terms of web logic licensing, the biggest difference between WebSphere and WebLogic is a software-based virtualization. If you have a server with multiple cores and you slice it up with VMware, with Oracle, you will pay for the entire server, even if your VM only uses a fraction of that server, like two cores out of eight. With IBM, with WebSphere, or not just WebSphere, all IBM products, we have subcapacity. That means you only pay for what you use. So in this configuration, IBM cost will be $47,000, WebLogic $210,000. So that's very, very expensive. And you could see that in terms of the technical support, Oracle does not certify VMware, ZVM, or Zen, Red Hat KVM as supported hypervisor environment where IBM does certify and support it. And in terms of pricing, IBM will recognize SAP capacity where Oracle will not. And I have a detailed article on my blog on whywebsphere.com with a lot of details about this. Now about the backup clustering. The hot cluster is obviously licensed in case of IBM and Oracle. The hot backup, the one that handles transactions, is also licensed with IBM and Oracle. But now the differences begin. For warm backup, the server is running but not handling transactions. With IBM no charge, with Oracle you have to pay. Cold backup, server is installed but not running. No charge with IBM, with Oracle. If you started more than 10 times in a year, calendar days in a year, you have to pay for it, which you should start it. The reason to have cold backup is to have the failover from your main cluster into the cold backup. So you should be doing monthly tests. And that means with Oracle, you gotta have to pay for your cold backup environment when you do those monthly tests. With IBM, it's free. And a disaster recovery environment, when it's not doing the work, with IBM is free, with Oracle, you have to pay. That gets very expensive, as you can see, it's more than three times as expensive. Now let's look at the topology. Typical web applications, they normally have the workload management tier. With IBM, we give you edge components for free. With Oracle, you have to pay for it, either hardware load balancer or Oracle web tier, which I highlighted right here in the spreadsheet. The web tier has a cost. The caching for your web services or HTTP uh, for web page fragment cache with IBM is free. Oracle is not. The HTTP servers themselves, with IBM they're free. With Oracle, web tier is not free. Now the app servers with IBM, they do have the cost. We did discuss backup options backup for this environment that would be free for some of these configurations with IBM again just like we discussed right here but for the main clustered environment you pay with IBM and you pay with Oracle but now look at the session database you can do in-memory session replication that would be free but for the HTTP sessions that you want to persist in a database, we give you DB2 license for free. With Oracle, you have to pay. For LDAP, IBM gives you, WebSphere comes with LDAP license for IBM Tivoli directory for free. With Oracle, you have to pay. So there are a lot of these things, so I listed them in this spreadsheet. Now let's combine all of that stuff together. With IBM, app server, you pay for the app server. You don't pay for edge components, for workload management, caching, database for HTTP session. You don't pay for 
HTTP server, you don't pay for LDAP. With Oracle, not only you pay for every one of these, but you also pay for the backup, disaster recovery, virtualization, and all of that, plus multiply by 32% worse performance, and you get almost a 10 times difference in cost. 10 times difference. Now, obviously, for any given configuration, you may not have all of these things, and maybe not all of these things, but there is still significant difference. Now, a lot of the data I presented in this session is covered in over 120 articles on this blog, ywebseer.com. And if you're not subscribed yet, in this little right-hand top corner of the blog, you'll see a little entry field. That's where you can put your email and click subscribe button and get notified when I post new articles. Um, the recent articles are on you can actually download this presentation with in PowerPoint format, this audio. You can download latest spec J results and you can see articles on ESB, on messaging, on app servers, Tomcat, JBoss and many other products covered. With that, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it.